fortunate to have Dr. Payet with us. And of course, we're very fortunate and very grateful to have um, Professor Schaller from uh, University of Toronto. Uh, he's a professor in um, uh, Slavic studies. I, I believe that it is Russian, uh, inter, uh, beginning Russian, intermediate Russian. Um, uh, Dr. Schaller has done uh, quite a bit of research. Uh, I can even say that he's the specialist in the, the Balkan dialects, the Slavic dialects. Um, and uh, he has been involved with us for a number of, uh, number of years. Uh, some of you probably know him uh, from before. Um, and then, of course, we had Dr. Pitt, who uh, lived most of his life in Macedonia. And he, um, he, he, uh, he expressed the desire also to talk a little bit about the lexicon, and to give his views and, and how it came about, and the language that's in the lexicon. Um, so overall, uh, it's, it's a sort of a, a, a venture of two professors here, the Historical Society, and, and we're happy to have you all here. So right now, I would like to introduce <coughs> as the first speaker, the, um, uh, Professor Schaller from the University of Toronto.
So this here was left, these two folk songs, one of these are love songs actually, are left untranslated. And I hope that I'm not, uh, it's not inappropriate on a Sunday to talk about love songs, but uh, that's what we have. I think, you know, we can't change the reality of the text in front of us. So here I'll start with that. May just to give you a sample of the look of the manuscript up close. Um, and I'd like to thank, this is silly, but I want to thank my wife for helping me with the technical preparation of this slide. Um, she knows how to scan documents and, and shape them so that they really come out better than they are on the printed page. Um, okay, so anyway, so um, yes. uh, you can hear me decently enough uh, if I just do a little bit from here. Is that okay? Because I don't want to get in any way. Okay, so the first, this is a kind of like verse, and the very first line, it's on the margin of the page, you'll see that. It feels something like this. So, uh, Lopoga. And you see the stress mark, this part. Of course, it's written in Greek, and it's very interesting because one of the things about this uh, man in the Macedonian context of this manuscript is that the accentuation is that of southwestern Macedonia. It's not that of literary Macedonia today. So it has that wonderful local color. We'll see more about that in the next uh, Of course, Koga is going to be Koga. <laughs> There are words in which you can tell that it's you know, the real local stress. Um, so, go poga sardense moya. So, my little hut, sardense moya. Now, a couple things about the way the letters are read in the Greek, but I'm not going to go into all the You can't hear. You can't hear. You know that maybe I'll just stay close to it. I'll just, I'll speak up so Virginia can hear me. Okay. Um, all right. The, <clears throat> one of the most interesting things I would say, I would start from the, the right-hand side. You see that large letter up there? That is actually Greek gamma. And it's followed by iota. And if you were going to transcribe this into Macedonian today or the literary type, you have N, O, Y, A, Moya. But what is uh, making this you know, clear that uh, we're uh, seeing it through a Greek uh, orthographic prism is that in Greek, uh, you know, Y, yeah, if you put the right vowel after it, uh, gamma, is pronounced as yeah, as well. Um, yeah. Another thing about that very first line is the, how to render de in Greek. Since de in the letters uh, is pronounced as the, you have to put, uh, you have to, and that's better, thanks so much. I think it looks a little funny, but, uh, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I'm a former circus performer, so. Uh, so, the, the, the de is actually not being rendered by delta, that very first word in the line. It's, take, you take uh, nu and tau, and you combine them together, and uh, it's going to be able to turn this There. Okay, I promise not to touch it again. Um, and uh, so this is actually one of the interesting problems in interpreting some of the uh, words in the uh, manuscript itself. Um, because uh, this, is, uh, this dialect that we're seeing reflected eventually in the manuscript is in a region of Macedonia where you have, uh, I've been to one of them in Albania actually, where you can say things like um, Zomp, uh, and uh, zambot and zambi, where you actually have an M sound in words like that, which makes it sound very much like Polish, if you know how Polish sounds as well. Um, this is a very rare and ancient feature that's uh, like Chendo. In fact, uh, uh, an old lady once approached my wife in the Skopje train station to ask for assistance. She must have, she was all in black, and she was about four foot eight, and she, and she said to my wife, Chendo, pomoki. But the interesting thing is Kinkchendo. This is incredibly archaic. It's one of the most amazing things about these particular Macedonian dialects. But if you think of, if Greek is putting N, Greek transcription, I mean, puts N in front of T, the question is, is that really going to be a word where you have like Zent, for Zet, you know, for your son animal? Is that really Zet or is it Zent? And you have to uh, look at all the examples before you come to the uh, proper conclusion. Um, any of it. But let's go back to our text, because we really just started. Uh, nothing exciting has happened yet. <laughs> so, do koga serdense moya, scrivom, and you can actually see the S, the little sigma, the K, looks very much like a Macedonian K, er, 
Er, right? E, von Scrivo. That would be so that people inside uh, secrecy, of course. Right? Scrivum das illumine. Scrivum das illumine. Um, and of course, if this is going on, you might be worried that people could discover what was going on. <laughs> and so he, in the next line, the third line, you have so strachovi. Strauvi. <laughs> but he, this is a stage, very good point there, uh, that very often nowadays the H is not pronounced and you get these new pronunciations, Strauvi, Strauvi. Um, but in this manuscript, which is, remember, the, the transcription here is almost, it's a fairly good transcription, being made by a fairly literate Greek, but from a Macedonian, I dare I say, compatriot, since they're both in the uh, Ottoman Empire, <laughs> but probably a townsman, uh, probably either from the village of Bolgasko, which was a major village at the time, or from the city itself of Kostor. And at that time, and with the watermarks indicate, by the way, the mid-16th century for this manuscript, if not sooner, um, uh, is turning up in all the places that, for example, you would find it in Russian, where her uh, doesn't uh, uh, go the, the route that it followed in Macedonia. So I will, I will stick to the pronouncing of the her uh, as written on the page for that reason, but um, indeed, this is uh, a very archaic feature uh, that usually is not there in, in modern Macedonian dialects. So, he, so our, our scribe here, the, the, the lover of the song, says, So strachoi pregulemi. <laughs> and uh, uh, then he moves on, dnovi, not denovi, not dni, but dnovi, uh, daselubi. He keeps coming back to this theme, of course, as the essence. So, and then the last two lines, he says, ela, for come here, it's very nice. Uh, and then, um, Ella, uh, then you have, um, uh, oh yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, he says, he's trying to say povroga, povraga, <laughs> damn it, you know, uh, but he ends up writing, the transcriber wrote pivroga, which is obviously not quite right, so, uh, Ella stan is actually the next word, meaning, you know, get up, there's not stani, but it's quick speech, where you leave out the e, right, Ella stan povraga chodi, and then, um, Povraga, let's see, Chodi. Now, Chodi looks like it's written Chonti, again, but we know that there is no N sound originally in Chodi. No Slavic language says Chonti for that, not even Polish. So that's a very good example. Right at the end of that, that's, uh, what fifth line down, we have the N, the N with a T next to it, to render the. It was the only way you could do it with the Greek alphabet. If you remember, if you put plain delta in there, you'd say Chodi. And, uh, that's like Gorno Kalanik, but that's uh, due to secondary of that. Finally, uh, and then the, the last line, you know, just wraps up the poem. Uh, do, now, the interesting thing about it is this and the other love poem in the text are two of the very small parts that aren't translated into Greek, uh, which is one of the interesting you know, kind of accidents. And, uh, it's not quite clear then, therefore, whether or not um, the Greek member of the, of the co-authorship, shall we say, really understood this, this poem in its full uh, degree. But uh, let's go back then to the major content, if, if I may, of the manuscript. Um, again, uh, but before I do that, I just want to show you um, one more thing from the page uh, where this excerpt occurs, okay? Which means I'll have to move back to the console. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just quickly. Yeah. I didn't mean to say enough about how and about where the oh, manuscript was found. I'm going to be talking about that. Oh, but I thought it, I, I thought it would be kind of a yeah, more fun to start this way. I hope it was at least interesting. You get to see some of the reality and, and a rather interesting part of the manuscript. It's not dry vocabulary after all that's involved here. Um, so this is actually, a folium, of course, is a leaf in a manuscript. And we're going to talk about the manuscript again, but I just want to show you what the kind of the original would have looked like to the discoverers. So I have not seen the original, of course. Ciro Gianelli and uh, Andrei Vajant, the two scholars, did. Um, especially Ciro Gianelli was a specialist in, in, um, in medieval manuscripts of the Greek time. Okay, so the passage we were looking at actually occurs at the upper right-hand corner corner, and then down. That's the margin of the text. These sort of elements in manuscripts, which are quite common, are called marginalia for that, to be on the margins of something. The interesting thing is the major central part is devoted to, this part is from uh, a, a classical work of Greek, uh, uh, 
a scholarship, or rather uh, poetry, Hesiod's Theogony. And there are actually two excerpts from two plays by Aristophanes in this manuscript. Um, plus uh, some religious texts for instruction, uh, done in classical and then sort of late, late classical, really um, patristic Greek. Um, so um, it, it's clear that the, the principal um, purpose of this manuscript was to instruct modern Greeks or people who are learning modern Greek, we'll kind of leave that open, but principally one would suppose uh, Greek um, teachers. Uh, the, what the classical Greek looked like, and, and also some of the major texts of the, of the early patristic writings. Um, so this, therefore, there are a lot of mar uh, interlinear comments made by the Greek um, uh, teacher or a scribe, we're not quite sure, student who used this manuscript, to learn, to explain words which had died out in modern Greek or had a different shape in modern Greek, and, uh, Greek as happens. So, so what you see then, therefore, is the big frame is the classical Greek and the, and the ecclesiastical Greek manuscript with marginalia embedded, which have both the demotic Greek, the Motiki, and Macedonian. But the Macedo when they come together, the Macedonian always goes first, and then it's glossed into Greek. And there are some features about the way the Macedonian is rendered, I'll mention, which indicate that the person who was writing in the uh, Macedonian part was not a native speaker of Macedonian. Although he must have been familiar enough, to, and he had a good ear, that he got most of the details. Um, at the bottom of the page, uh, again, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes on the bottom of the page, because marginalia also include things that you fit in at the bottom of the manuscripts. The, in the classical manuscript, you never filled up the entire page with the basic text. Um, this was uh, uh, you know, a common practice not to fill it all the way to the bottom or to the edge. This always allowed room for further commentary and historical layers to emerge, as we see here. So I'm going to now go to the bottom of the text, and what we find at the bottom of this page is something much more representative of the 300 entries that constitute the so-called lexicon that we're looking at. Um, let me see if I go up and I go down. Uh, okay, we're now at the bottom of that page, if you understand, uh, bear with me. And we'll go to the second column. And um, this vocabulary, by the way, is organized very much like if you were going to do field work in a Macedonian dialect, as I once did, I use Professor Bojidar Vidoisky's Prashonik. <laughs> and a Prashonik is a questionnaire, and you kind of you go around the, as it were, the world that the person lives in and ask them about things. Or uh, you might ask, you know, uh, words about family kinship terms. You might ask about agricultural terms. But you try to put it all together, because it then forms a very natural uh, way to engage in a conversation with the person from the village you're trying to learn the dialect of. And that's what's going on here, because the very first word that we see in that second column is proso. <laughs> and then the word that follows it is etchmen. Now, in standard Macedonian, that would be yachmen. And this is just a very interesting, just like we have yazik and ezik, that kind of difference. So we have yachmen and etchmen. These go back to that difference in nasal vowels I was mentioning earlier. So proso, etchmen, and then oves. Oves is at the bottom. You can see that the O uh, is stressed. The V follows. He's added an extra vowel at the end, though. That, that O uh, that you see at the end is uh, not uncommon. Remember in masculine nouns, mashki wrote yeah, a nouns of that type. In Macedonian, they usually go, let's say, mash, zet, oves, right? Uh, they end in a consonant. Well, Greek, um, as a rule, the most common types of declension end in a vowel, even if they're masculine, os, that kind of thing, right? Uh, so the scribe here, this is the thing where you can tell this was not being transcribed by a Macedonian or put down straightforwardly. There would be no reason the Macedonian would say oves or oesu, unless he was thinking about maybe the definite article. But, you know, but he said this guy writes bricho for, you know, for, he, he, and every once in a while he'll put like patot, you sometimes have the te in there and sometimes mostly not. But um, he comes from a region clearly where there was no o going to u. You know, like in strumits or when they say gulem. Um, that's because gulem, the o goes to an u when it's not stressed. Uh, that's not typical of this uh, text. So you get these extra vowels added on the end that seem to be somehow to make it just slightly more Hellenized for the person, but they're not pronounced. Um, that's, then we go on to the next little column. You see that large in the middle column there? That looks like a ze, right? Uh, then it looks. Then comes o, then comes m, and then pe. And for a minute there, when I first looked at this, 
but it doesn't go with prosa and oves. I thought of zol, <laughs> right? You know, that hard stuff you might break your teeth on. But this is actually the word zol, zol, that you fodder, that you would feed to a horse. This is, I don't know, if it, is this word still known to you, zol? Yeah. There you go. And you see, he's, the, the Greek transcription of it has to be em and pe. As if you know, if you wander down the Danforth, you'll see lots of words like this, you know, on the signs in uh, that part of town. So this is actually zol, which goes very well with all this. And then comes quod. The interesting thing is quod, of course, is not fodder or food or something you grow or feed anyone, but it's the animal you would give it to. So naturally, zol and quod. And you see quod there with the n. Um, he puts the accent mark over that, um, just because he has to put an accent mark on a word, even if it's just one syllable. In other words, this is not quod. There are some Macedonian dialects that are comparatively rare. We still have a soft nia there, but this is not one of them. And then we get, the corn needs what? He needs uzda, you know, the bit that you put in the mouth of the corn. And uh, that's the bottom word on that, where you go o, u, se, and then nda. Um, maybe I'll skip over to just the last two words. If you're looking at the, uh, on the far right there, there are two words. And the one begins ze, e, le, and then he does this little thing that's not typical of the Greek. He combines the iota with a to pronounce ya. And you get what looks like zelyazo. And what do you think zelyazo really is? Zelyazo. Better than my students in my classes. Um, yeah, zelyazo, yeah, right. Okay. So we have the tretosložniot accent, and we have the vtorisložniot accent. And this is a perfect example of it being of the stress system, where you don't say ucheni, you say ucheni, ucheni ulie, not ucheni ulie. Um, there's, there's a lady I knew who worked um, on the grounds in, at the university, and she would say ucheni, and to uh, neaskopsko. <laughs> you need to, and this, uh, so not only is it though, it's not just jelezo, but it is jelezo, and this is the most archaic feature of this uh, uh, text that we see again and again. There are some exceptions, though. For example, he writes elsewhere, dedo, not diato. And um, in his poetry, which could be influenced from the north, because poetry of this love type traveled from the north uh, and circulated through the towns, he says, lepa, bella, not lepa, bella. Now, it may sound a little bit exotic at first. God forbid, I hope you don't think it sounds Bulgarian to you to say it that way. Because there are actually Macedonian dialects that, that do have this, but they're not common. But remember, when we're looking at Kostur, we're, taking, we're looking at the southern periphery of the Macedonian speech area. And if you have a, an archaic sound, it's most likely, this is, we call these things peripheral archaisms in linguistics. And uh, these southern Macedonian dialects really have it in spades. <laughs> they have Chendo, and you have Shadazo. Chendo, though, not here. I've tried, I've, now, and then the other word, of course, would be, if you have Shadazo, you might have something like um, uh, Strebro that comes after it. This is the other thing about this dialect, though. They don't say srebro, but strebro, and they don't say sreda, they say streda. This probably sounds fairly normal to most of you, am I right or not? Yes. Yeah, it's yes, okay. Again, this is a very natural thing. You know, we do this in English. We did it, <laughs> that is. Um, again, I'm talking in general terms, and you know, everyone has different ancestors, but when I say we do it in English, if you take the word for humility, and then you just make an adjective about it. Well, they originally were saying things like humo, humo. But how do we say it today? Uh, if, you're, if you have humility, you are humble. And that little be that comes out of nowhere, it has nothing, it's not in humility, right? It's not in the Latin word that we borrow eventually. Um, it pops up between those two other sounds to make the transition easier. So by the same token, sereda, streda, it's a very natural thing. By the way, this is true even in ultra Slavonic. In ultra Slavonic texts like the um, um, Zogar Fences, uh, the, one of the, the oldest manuscript possibly, um, of the Gospels anyway, that instead of saying Israel, they say Israel, death. So this is very much like saying Strebro instead of Strebro. Okay, um, now I'm going to uh, turn to maybe back a little bit more, having sampled here, and talked a bit about what I consider at least some of the interesting parts of the language we see reflected in the Macedonian time. To go just a little bit more into the background of the discovery of the manuscript and this sort of thing, um, with, if you uh, bear with me, I'll scroll up to the top of the page. Then. This 
obviously much too much material here to use in one day, so I, I'll, be, I'll be sparing in it. Um, so this is this scholarly edition I refer to. Uh, John Nelly was a specialist in uh, Greek manuscripts and worked in the Vatican Library as well. Anthony Vaillant, of course, is a great Slavic specialist uh, from the mid 20th and early 20th century. Um, but he had a particular fondness for things Macedonian and South Slavic, as did his colleague Mazon, um, who even brought texts from Albania uh, that he um, has a huge book on. Um, all right, so just to acknowledge our uh, predecessors in the field, the manuscript itself is a particular one, you know, codex or the bound manuscript. The Capitula Library at St. Peter's in Rome, it's the one that everyone, you have to have, if you want to go there, I went to their site. <laughs> If you want to use the library, you have to have a very specific manuscript re request that you make. You can't just walk in and kind of browse around. Um, it's worse than the Library of Congress in that fashion, if you ever used one of those. Um, the, it was donated to St. Peter's, though. And this is a member of St. Peter's. It's Catholic. Oh, that's probably my daughter. I'll, t I'll turn off my cell phone. Uh, Hopefully she'll get the message. Sevrat ni kerka so to nazet. Sega, ima, kuh je ta premnogo. As you can see, it's starting to interfere with my personal and professional life. Now, to get back to our manuscript, if I may. Um, the, the interesting thing about the manuscript um, is there were many of these circulating in, in the Middle East, uh, particularly in Jerusalem and um, this one was donated by uh, an Orthodox uh, prelate named Sylvester. We have his name in 1620. Um, so the, some of these elements are actually uh, in included in the manuscript itself. The manuscript actually consists of three different parts. Uh, the middle part is the, was, and it was bound together finally only in, in, later on um, in, in the 19th century in the form that we see it. Nonetheless, uh, the interesting thing though, the donation was not made to uh, an Orthodox prelate, but to St. Peter's and Norman. That's a question for Gianelli uh, to work upon. Um, it was discovered finally in 1940, but the publication was delayed due to World War II to 1958 by Cardinal Giovanni Mercati. Um, and it, it consists of actually 220 folia, and we're only looking at three of them. And yet we find 300 Macedonian words and phrases which are of so much importance. So little things come in big packages, in a way. <laughs> but those packages themselves um, are really not that large. The contents I've already explained, these are, it was clearly designed to instruct a person in classical Greek and uh, scholastic, uh, patristic Greek. And um, the general purpose, uh, I think we can move on here, therefore. The part we've actually already sampled is, is this uh, Macedonian Greek portion. Um, it's just these uh, small number of folia. Um, and I don't see any particular need to begin. The, the uh, untranslated folk songs stand out. Now we get to something very particularly interesting and very local. Uh, one of the very first phrases, by the way, all my examples if, uh, on the handout, and if anyone would like to, I'd be quite happy to send them this, but uh, uh, the further version of the handout if they ever wish. Um, the, I number all my examples based upon the entry in the lexicon as it's published by Janelli and Bayan. So number 11 here means fairly early on at the end of the first phrases. Um, at the beginning he uses more phrases, by the way. In fact, the first very word is gospodine. You notice it's not gospodine, but gospodine, brate. And then you have things like dapoidine, um, darabotine, daspime, not daspime, but daspime, dayane. And dayane, not dayane. Very slow phrases like that begin it. It, so it's kind of like warming things up, and then he gets down to now the long list of vocabulary about, you know, dedo, uh, stara, for testa, test. You, 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 you just be amazed how many words you just recognize whatever you want to transcribe. Uh, but nonetheless, somewhere near the very beginning, actually at the end of these phrases, before he gets into the vocabulary list, the scribe saw fit to uh, have this sentence come in, and it suggests a very local origin, perhaps, of one of the two people involved, no doubt the Macedonian, because most of the villages were. Uh, 100% Macedonian, except for those with other populations. Uh, but the majority was so decidedly Macedonian speaking. And then you get this phrase here, and I'll uh, do it, um, stand out of your way. So we'll go with the Greek first, um, just so we can it can feel the original. Uh, then what you have that follows um, is actually the transcription by uh, Vaillant and uh, Ginelli, mainly Vaillant, the, the Slavist 
And then what I have done in all of my examples after this, I've decided not to burden you with the Latin transcription. I just went straight to basically a Macedonian modern a Cyrillic transcription. And so I didn't want to do that every time to save space. Okay. So as you see, old koya stranata. Now what the, the scribe has done there is he's gotten a little bit confused about where da should go. Uh, so da just gets tacked onto strana. That is not stranata, na koya. So it's not the definite form of strana, but stranata da poinime. And uh, he actually slipped there. He did decided not to put the little extra n in for the descent. So od koja strana da poinime bogasko. Now, if this had been a Greek speaker, by the way, um, delivering the message in Macedonian, which would be improbable, um, he would have stressed the last syllable. That's where this uh, town name is stressed in Greek today. But this is Bogasko. Now, it, as it comes out eventually, people then say later Bogatsko. If you look at the map today um, by the Slavic scholars who uh, studied the coastal region, a couple of half, that it, it's Tse, Bogatsko. But it doesn't have anything to do with being wealthy. The location of, of Bogasko was in a narrow pass uh, coming from the south, leading into the valley where Lake Kostor is, Kostorsko Ezero. And uh, a Bogas is this old Greek, uh, sorry, Turkish word for a narrow pass. Uh, Bogaskoi is a typical name, for example, of a village located in a, pat, a mountain pass of that type. So where is Bogatsko? Again, some of you really may know even better than I do, uh, uh, or can, can recollect from the past. And I don't presume to teach you <coughs> geography here. Um, but just for the general purposes, or for uh, just in case, um, here uh, is a, a general display of what we might call Aegean Macedonian dialects and some neighboring dialects to the north. Kostor, as we all know, is far over to the west. We'll come back to this map a little bit. But we need a more detailed map to find Bogasko, of course. And Bogasko on this map, this is uh, prepared by the, uh, in a book by a Bulgarian scholar uh, who is from the region. Um, uh, uh, um, Shklifov, um, uh, which is an entire separate story we'll go into. So, but Bogatsko is down on the far, far right. So that's where the, the, the mountain pass leads so to an entirely different region of Macedonia. So it itself is on the periphery of, the, of this little periphery. Um, and the, the district, the kind of general region is called as Popole. There's um, various, the part that uh, Chris, Professor Kramer and I visited uh, is far to the north, you see where Vunda is. And um, there's, uh, of course, some of these villages you go, we went up to the border and saw that they were completely devastated and empty, sadly enough. Um, Vunda and Smrdesh. Uh, so just, uh, but that whole general region is called, you know, Koreshtata. And um, then down below is Nestransko. But Kostor, it, the lake and the town are kind of in the center where, you know, where you have a, a, more or less a valley. It's a lot of mountains there. Uh, but Bogat School itself, you see, if that's the one, I hope you can tell, it's the farthest lo uh, lower right hand village. But it was relatively important at the time, according to what Jen Hamming writes, at least. Um, okay, so uh, this is interesting. Uh, for the f maybe I'll jump to this thing about how you say the word for uh, tooth and show you why it might be interesting. <laughs> Zompir is the way it originally sounded, so we say back in ultra Slavonic times. There's a special letter for it. Which is a combination of O and an M-like sound, and uh, and in Polish today's O. Uh, the interesting thing is only in some of the coastal dialects today, and again this is uh, uh, Shklifov's work, not mine, um, the, where uh, the M sound is still there, but they're typically in the more western regions, um, and it varies. Some places you'll have Zomp, Zombi, or Zomba. Uh, at others you'll have uh, you'll even have Zomp, even when there's a pet following it. So it varies a lot. But once you get to those villages on the right, you see where it's kind of blank. Um, those are to the west of Kostor. They say they're either zup, and very rarely in the north, zap. Zap being more like the northern speech, shall we say. Zup being more typical of southern Macedonian dialects in general, in fact. This kind of a uh, um, And Bogasko should be, of course, in that kind of zup uh, region. The, the problem being is this, that there was no perfect vowel to transcribe that sort of sound with the Greek. And he seems to have chosen the ah. And it's a bit of, it's an open question whether or not there were still some vowels of an intermediate sort of ah sound that, you know, were difficult to render, or whether or not um, we're really not talking about someone from Bogasko, but someone maybe a bit from farther to the north where they really did say zap. So these are mysteries that are very difficult to solve. But we do have a locate, uh, it's something that localizes a village where there aren't usually these, the M sounds. 
And in fact, that's what the vocabulary gives us, bears out. Uh, so in this very specific uh, connection, um, we can use the modern dialectology to kind of um, fit in and uh, support what we find in our text regarding the uh, potential origin of the uh, uh, speakers. Okay, now, why is this text so important, aside from all the uh, reasons I've mentioned so far? Well, um, in fact, it is the oldest vernacular text that we have in the sense of a pure vernacular uh, in, in, in Macedonian um, linguistics. Um, it actually is a couple centuries ahead of uh, the uh, Chetvareznic, uh, the Tetragoson by uh, Hajid uh, from a little bit farther to the west. Um, it also, there, you might have heard of the Damaskinita. Uh, the Damascenes were, um, are generally considered to be the most widespread early vernacular text, but uh, translated from a, a Greek um, uh, uh, preacher, uh, Damaskin Studit, who was uh, putting together a compilation of uh, holy tales and, and uh, sermons. Um, very entertaining reading, actually, the miracles and the travels and blah, um, for, But he put it into demotic Greek. And it was therefore immediately accessible to the bilingual population, which was so common uh, at the time. And they, it's translated and spread like wildfire throughout the Balkans. But the first fellow who translated it was Grigori of Pelagonia, which you know, we're talking about Beetle and the three places at that time. Um, and uh, this is the, the, one of the earliest versions that we have. But it is still maybe 30 years older than this text that we have here. The other thing about this, the Damaski is Damascene always has bits of the, that are more like religious language and moral, and uh, you get passages that are very much like kind of a, a, a later version of ultra Slavonic. But what we have here is pure vernacular. So that makes it um, amazingly uh, important for, for historical linguist anyway. Now, this stress uh, on the second syllable back, I think I'm not gonna uh, uh, overwhelm you here with all those little details about the uh, use of the letters and the like. Um, in fact, um, what I was thinking of doing instead, with, with your permission, is I'm going to, I, what I did at one point, just to immerse myself in the materials, I transcribed it all out for myself. And I'm going to give you a feeling for this, and then I'll be, just take a few minutes more of your time. Um, regarding uh, the vocabulary itself, just so you can, uh, just so you'll come away with a further conviction that um, there's a historical continuity in Macedonian, which goes back at least uh, three or four centuries. Okay. So the, the uh, so the it begins with the greetings. They say Gospodina, Brate, and then Dasi Zdrav, Dasi Prost. Now Dasi Prost is interesting because in Russian you say Brashanis, right? So it's a, a, a very kind of old-fashioned way of greeting um, that doesn't always survive because it has this thing of kind of cleaning the slate, you know, forgiving one another and, and, and not being simple. And have the, no, no hard feelings left over. So it's very old, in my opinion, at least. Das ist drauf, das ist prost. Sort of formula, formulaic expression. Then, ostavini, ostavini das bime. So let us sleep, right? Now the interesting thing here is they're saying ostavi with two stresses. Because when you put the ni for us after, you have ostavi, you get this kind of rhythm going. But it's not uh, ostavini or ostavini, but ostavi with stress on that first syllable. Every time, and there are lots of little commands sprinkled about here. Every time it's a command, and you, you do this with D, you don't get D, it's on that very first syllable. And so, premenise, get dressed, there's a syllable. And the fellow answers, promenise, uh, where he shifts the stress back, um, you know, because he's using the past tense. Um, so, ela da yame ita I'm not kidding, this is what it really says. Tota poyena da rabotime. Okay, now again, this thing about the accent here is it's following its own logic. In the present tense, you don't have to put the accent on the second symbol from the end. You don't say, by the way, he's saying, it's not, and uh, which is typical farther the north, but this is very common. I, uh, I once taught a class with Professor Kramer when she um, had an important conference, and I was very happy to, and Macedonian students in the class were saying, but the verb, when, it, when it's email, it sounds so much more natural to do it that way. And of course, that they're from regions very similar to this. So the poidin and the rabotin. Um, here's where he betrays the Greek, uh, the transcriber. He should say, why is it specific bread? Of course it's not specific bread. 
It's just a, it's a, it's a masculine noun that should have a vowel if it's going to be somehow Hellenized. So this is a slip of the pen that betrays the, uh, the transcriber. Imata li kavo da kupine? Imata vino da kupine? Od koje strana da pojdemo vo bogasko? There you go, and now we're back to our situation. And then he slips in, it's natural to slip in a couple of Greek words by osmosis, if you will. Takte, for takate. If any, this means perhaps. I don't know this word. Have you guys ever, anyone here ever takate? This must have gone the way of the dinosaur then. Or maybe he even put it in himself, but it's transcribed. It's what the fellow then said, takte da ftasame durveche. Maybe we'll make it there to Bogasco before evening. Da ftasame durveche, the Okay, da se pros taspime. Keeps going back to sleeping. Now, then what follows is uh, various fauna, the creatures uh, of, of the wild, typically. So, zayats, srna, prle, not all so wild. Ovni, ovni are of course always in the plural, right? There's always gangs of them. Uh, Mrave, you'd expect a single. Serevetsi, it's hard to find single worms. And then div krmnya, that's a wild boar. <laughs> Divya, wild animals in general. Soko, vrapci, yastreb. And then, you know, and I think most Slavic says lastovitsa or something for that bird, but they say vlastovitsa with a V at the beginning. Does that sound good to anybody here? Vlastovitsa with a V? Unusual to me, at least. Um, it happens in Czech, apparently. But that's not. Then vrani, yarabitsi. Now you're noticing something going on. That itsa likes to get the stress all the time on the itsa. And uh, this is that, sec uh, it's called penultimate stress that we see. Golobi. Golobi. Stress on the middle syllable again, not call of the word, whatever it might be. It's cosets, that's actually co, you know, I know it as cos or co or the black word. Now it's a, it's a diminutive s, makes it small, right? But what is that s doing at the beginning? Uh, this totally mystified Mayan. Mayan knew much more about historical linguistics than I will ever know. So you get these local innovations that are very peculiar that may, may or may not survive. Now, I don't want to then, um, you know, uh, presume too much upon your patience. You've been very kind so far. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just recite to you a couple of the holidays that are mentioned here. Uh, they come a bit later. So, na voditsi, for the epiphany, right? Na svetnitsi, for Palm Sunday. Na veligden. Now, again, I'm hung up on accent, I admit, but he didn't say na veligden. It's not uncommon sometimes in dialects where they fix the stress on that second to the last syllable. To sh Remember, the word in Russian is veliki. really was stressed on the and if you put them next to that, it kind of turns it into a, uh, you know, a, a word with more syllables. And you could say the ig then. And you still keep to your rule about, you know, having the stress uh, where it comes on the second syllable frame. But no, they say velig then. They keep velig then. Sveta Petka, right? Bogoroditsa. Again, not Bogoroditsa, as in Bogoroditsa. Hey, this is this clearly uh, southwestern Macedonian stress. And maybe to wrap it up with what you do at a feast day. Dapokladina, <laughs> put stuff on the table, right? Meso, sireni, again, not sireni, sireni. Meako, with the gaps, again, ancient. Yaitsa, hlab, vino, so. And then they, at the wedding scene, they send, they, they, there's a, uh, a greeting, which I'll leave you with. Dasaradvame. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm going to read something of Costa Pérez because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important that we mention his background a little bit. Okay, Costa Pérez is one of the most important figures in the studies of the Macedonian language of modern times. He was born in the city of Strumica, Republic of Macedonia, and after his primary and secondary education, um, he actually educated or taught in the city of Strumica and then uh, moved to uh, Skopje, which is the capital of Macedonia. Of course, here he was involved with the university and he taught various aspects of the Macedonian language. Uh, the university in Skopje is Kirill and Metodia, which we probably most of us know. Um, he received his doctorate in uh, Kukushki speech, uh, or Govor, uh, which is, of course, from the region of Kukush, um, which unfortunately, if we go back a few years, 
uh, basically got all demolished or wiped out from the face of the earth. Um, that's a historical fact. Now, this is the, the city where actually the, um, our famous uh, revolutionary Cotsa Delta was born. Some of you may know that, I just wanted to mention that. Um, now, one of, the, uh, one of his greatest achievements, Dr. Peyev, is the lexicon or dictionaries, uh, which I will call them dialectical dictionaries, from the southeast parts of the Aegean part of Macedonia, uh, currently you know, in Greece, or occupied by Greece. Um, the Kukushki Govor, of course, was spoken quite a while ago, and some of you may wonder, is it still a spoken? I, I'm going to venture to say that even though very, very um, spread out, there are still speakers uh, to be found. Uh, probably these are more of the older generation, because as the new generation comes up forward, uh, unfortunately the language is uh, not spoken. However, thank you uh, to Dr. Uh, Peth, this is recorded. You know, the Kukushki Govor is recorded, the dictionaries are recorded. Um, this is a creation of six volumes uh, of the dictionary, and uh, they number way, well over 2,000 pages. Um, now, they're of course available, you know, if somebody is interested, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to get these dictionaries. Um, now, briefly, we have to state that uh, Dr. Pei was nominated for as an academic at the Macedonian Academy of Sciences, and he has been also awarded various awards, uh, some of which are as follows: the award of the Edinaisti Oktomri, award of Sveti Kliment Okritski, uh, award Gotze Delchev, award of the city of Stromitsa, Grad Stromitsa, and so on. These are one of the highest, if not the highest, awards that you can get, you know, at this time or earlier. Uh, in the Republic of Macedonia. Of course, he was also part of the uh, uh, work that was done with um, the General Linguist Linguistic Atlas of Slavic Languages uh, and the Carpathian Dialect, Dialectic Linguistic Atlas. Uh, this is in Europe. And towards the end, I want to complete here is he was recognized by various European universities such as Moscow in Russia, Bratislava in Slovakia. Krakow in Poland, Brno in Czech Republic, uh, and of course Ljubljana, Slovenia, where he had made a number of um, appearances and so on. <coughs> um, he has published over 180 linguistic studies, and of course the volumes of the, uh, of the Dialectical Dictionary of the Southeast Parts of Macedonia, Aegean Macedonia, which is well over 2,000 pages, as I, as I mentioned. So, again, uh, we are very proud to have Dr. Costa Pev uh, present his views on the lexicon. Um, and I, I might just comment that his views, even though they didn't talk with Dr. Schaller, they're very, very much the same. I can see you can't hear me there. Uh, they're the same, on the same kind of um, uh, level, if you will, or uh, the understanding of all this. Uh, anyways, Dr. Costa Pev, Poveli. Um, you have all in you with you the uh, little book that I handed out, and it's it's in English as well as in Macedonian. For those who do not understand or cannot read the English, the Macedonian is right there. It's in the middle of the book. Hello. Чудовна, 
Понатам му, сакам да кажам дека известни славости, што се јавуваат од техничко погреб во реператот, се резултат на моето, така да кажам, вклопување во животот во Торонто, и може би формата таква каква што е, сепак задоволува благодарејќи на помошта од господата Одисеј Белчевски и господинот Кристепов. Ја изразувам својата благодарност. Големата важност на речникот на Киро Гянеди, што денеска го анализираме, тоа е од фактот дека тој представува документ за посебността на македонскиот во однос на соседните югословенски јазици, српскиот и богарскиот. Посебност да се доче на одамна скоро пред пет века со речникот. Во времето кога е пишна речникот до 16-тиот век, Македонија е по турско робство, што започнало по одамна, уште во 1392-та, кога отоманките се поживиле и во Македонија. Тоа е 50 години по нивното надрегување на Балканот и само неколку години по познатата Косовска битка. Иако Исмот бил единствена званично признаена званично признаена религија, сепак се имало известна толеранција матурограничина и кон православното христијанство кон така наречениот милет. Споменатова толеранција била поголема и давала повеќе можности од колку што денеска даваат право на македонците во некои соседни земји да потенцираме дека во Грција се негира македонската последност, идентитет, Во Бугарија се негира нашата историја и нашиот јазик. Во Србија се негира нашата религија. Во таа смисла, особено во 15-тиот век, кога Охридската архиепископија била во процесот, може да се допуште дека овој факт во известна смисла допринел за некаков културен и религиозен живот во Македонија, па да се создаде и речникот за кој те не скак изборуваме. Сепак, ова клима не траела многу време, во втората половина на 16-тиот век веанијато на Охридската архиепископија под притисок по степено гине, за да биде укината од султан Мустафа III во 1767-та година. Во периодот што го споменуваме, исто така доаѓа до славење на Отуманското царство, а негативните елементи од животот на народот се продолочуваат. Треба да се истакне дека како противтежа во Македонија почнува да доминира западно европското влијание, особено во економијата и трговијата. Во врска со периодот што го споменуваме, малку потоцно во 17-тиот век, како важна настан треба да се спомене инвазијата на Австрија во Македонија, односно австрийско-турскиот конфликт во кој се инкорпорира и погоната на македонскиот народ во седевисточниот Кумановско Кривопаванечкиот регион. Погоната, така наречено Карпошово во Станије, било резултат на економското и политичкото населство од турското великодржавије. Првите усписи во Станијето било населно задушено, а водачот Карпош, Карпош и уфрлен во реката Бадр. Разграничувањето меѓу македонските, македонскиот и соседните јужнословенски јазици, што го споменавте на самиот почеток, се разбира дека започнува многу порано, делот 16-тиот век, туку уште во старославенскиот период, кога се оформиле две школи со своји посебности, Охридска или Степи Климентова за македонскиот, и Преславска за бугарскиот јазик. Сепак, во текстовите од споменатеве школи, разликите не се многу изразени, меѓу другото и затоа што тие се со религиозна содржина, а се знае дека таквата содржина не тр промени. Додека, 
po spominati od reči Gianelli, na poko se posebnosti na narodi od jazik, povrzeni so drevena regija, po široka smisla postovska, isto odreden period, ko se go omejuva srednjo vekovjeto, od prvih enih kupci na prerobata in decidno od 16. veka. Se razmi za dialektne reči o jazeče makeronski, so objasnjenje na jazeči, no isto kajate na tolkove ideji, iako nerodobno, neredobno, za nekoj leksički jedinici sledova po široko objasnjenje. Kako, na primer, objasnjenje za tolke imene so Jorgano, skrivom da se ljubive, ne te kiva i drugo. Na pokaz so okolo 300 narodni zborovi, regionalno vrzani, kako što rekao mi so kosturski odgovor, što opatuva na razni strani od života, na domakinstvo, ishranata, rodinskite vrski, telovi na čvečko do telo, proizvodnite odnosi, religijata i sl. Kako što rekao mi, rečnikot ima dobra istorija. To je potekno už od 60. vjetek, a pečeden je zimbo sa svinata na 20. vjetek, bo objavil profesor Kiro Djanevi Odri, osorao je sa Andrej Vajan, profesor pri Univerzitetu do Paris, koji što je napravil i lingvistička analiza. Dijelektiv u Makedonija se grupira v tri narečija. Se pod poslovni se dve, istočno i zapadno, ki bi bilo rekla vada. Od trebuto nareči predvoja tipiško marijonskite in kustnih verinskih govori, što ušte se imenovati i kako prevozi, kde jih sodržat osobenosti i od istočnoto i od zapadnoto. V osmenati od rečni, se je kjava nekaj posledov, med povike jazični karakteristiki, što potvrtuva, da je marijona makedonskite govori mnogo odavno se imovat so svoji karakteristiki. Kako prvo, da ki spomenime onije, što dialektata baza na rečnikot, jad povrzovat so osnovnite elementi na makedonski odjazd, posle na primer bobenje na definiracijata, odsosno na padeži, posle redko skazno se pisati do rečnikot, na primer, tako se navodja višnjego boga, ili vode po vraga. Padežite, što ki nema tamo, redko ne samo se mali ostatoci, Redovno se upotrebovali v drugite slovenski jazici, posle na Tvarsko. Tore ta pojava, ki pojavate na členu, da je isto upodrzala so osnovnatika materijalnosti govor. Primer, dušetak, odnosno o rečenica ne bi vezni dušetak, no se srkjavate v drugi primeri, vjatrenoto, patrot. V ovije dve karakteristiki, gobenje po na definacijate na padežnice i členu, nastanane po period, po stariot period, pod vijanije na balkanskata jazična alijansa, to je na sosednim dvene slovenski jazici, a romanskito, grečkito, albanskito. Dvete posrednosti, posle nebo makedonskijo, funkcionira tušte in obdarstvo jazik, no odsostuva od srpske, kako i od drugite slovenski jazici. Naši ljude, tam bolo da je razlog sredi, što strukturata je pukvalno smeneta i ostanal samo rečnikot, što malo se povrzalo s odrbite slovenskih. Rečnikot je povrzala do karakteristiki, da govor se so se mnogo delo. Kako tipična makedonska posebnost, kako tipična makedonska posebnost, presutno i v rečniku, predstavila zamenata na svaroslovenskijo glas on, so a, primerite se natrija, stapolka, sabota, gaz, patot, madeć. V bogarski od zamenata je so temen glas p, pa tam imame kas, pt, vtre, a v srpski od sou, pa imame primeri put, gozica. Isključo kot prvivoto za zamenata na on so a, v reči kot predstavila zboru od kutja, to profesor Andrej Vajan bo tretira za pozajme serviza. Iako redko v rečniku se registrirani slučevi so začevan 
Но сега ще го е на зализа. И е рънка на мисторак, що е обично и за други косовски говори, но, за, но и за солунски от биалек. Именно в вашите случаи, по кои се явуват остатъци от носовият изговор, так ви се примерите ранка и рънка на месторака, мънка на месомака, пън на месопат. Помогна ли да победи теорията на Ватрослав Ягич само едноското потепто на старословенски отяз? За новата носа в ПЕ не бъл остатък с образовани от избор, боечните, а тако А, както сте частичност, е това, що не изима от избор, не се мешал с носотката ОН, като сте в централните говори, а на место литературните форми язик и аз унявя, во речникот на Гянели, на Гянели се рекаваме Ечимен, Егленье, Заец, како што е и во некои источни говори. Како периферен говор, от каде потекнува речникот, во материалот се јавуваат повеќе карактеристики што напомнуваат на архаичката сосредка, т.е. на старословенскиот јазик. Како прво, да го споменеме широкиот изговор на стариот баз Јад, такви се примерите Холјано, Јако, Невјаста, уште еден пример во контекст, има е Хјако, но има и случаи со Е, пример Целван, Дедо, Левна. Варпите примери се срекаваат прилично на исток, во Солунско, Серско и Драмско. Со некои примери се допира со богатскиот јазик, но не со сите. Пример, нас има случаи от приятен горешнито, но богатскиот јазик се срекява претено. Меѓу главните карактеристики на македонскиот јазик, со кои се отделува по соседни пилионосковенски јазик, представува и замената на големиот ЕР со рефлексот О. Пример, Сон, Боза. Во Сръбскиот замената е СОА. Па имаме сън, баз. Во бугарскиот е со тенен глас Ъ, па имаме сън. Спомената за специфичност за македонскиот язик, то е замената со О, е регистрирана и го речникот, што го анализираме. Там усрекаваме нощи, то се виски направа во домакинство то, по сръбскиот е нашле. Во връзка со консонантизмот, Първо пристапяме дека во лексичките единици, регистрирани во речникот, во замената на тасловенските групи ТЕЙОТ и ТЕЙОТ, се чува първичната замена ШТО и ШТО. Примери ВРЕШТА, НОЩТВИ, ЈАЖДА, РОЖДА. Наместо заменат со КЕГЕ, како што е во централните говори, се перекја НОКИ. Споменатова замена ШТО и ШТО се срекива уште и во некои источни говори, пример во Малишевските. Уште и в българският язик, додека в сръбският замената е с огласови, що са варианти на македонските КГ. Все пак, в речникот аватализирано КГ се явува и в неитимолошки примери, в случаят на краят на лексемата ложник, що значи дебел, вовмен покривач, появата е регистрирана осен в речникот и в Солунско во зборот език, истиот пример, но без назаден призвук и со редукција го констатиравме и во истражувањата, што ги вршихме во Кокушко, там се рекаваме език. Ни до старите зачувани форми от фарасовенскиот јазик по речникот, треба да се споменат уште две архаични посебности. Прво, дека многу добро се чува глас од Х, и тоа во сите позиции, во почетокот на зборот, на крајот и во интервокална позиција. Пример, ходи овамо, хляб, имале, врх, мух и ухо. Додека во сегашниот период, во развитокот на македонскиот јазик, гласот хај е попазна на изчезнување, односно е заменен со гласот В, особено во западното наречие. Надам, да споменеме дека старата група чрија, Во зборови во речникот се чува со изговор чер. Па имаме забележно черепна. Черепна е направа во која се пече леп. Наместо литературното средна 
Истопът е уречен до църква на вечерия в намесо трева. Регенбът на язичните характеристики, регистрирани в уречението, ще да завърши на съсъднование на некои стари сборови, що денеска се заменуваат са други, но се присутни по некои от съседните язици. Например, за притавската лев, що значи лъв, Освен што е скомната во речникот, на широко се јава во Локостовско. Пример во изразот, стена девојка, што си лепа. Единственото реално објаснување е дека збор постоја во нашиот стар јазик, одана, но во другите диалекти се изгубил. Вистина, дека предпоставката за влијание од црпскиот јазик не би можела да се одржи, зашто централни демонкеновски говори, зборо, него, познава, не е присутен. Исто во објаснување важи и за глаковот зове, со значење вика, присутен во речник, во изразот, как те зовет на име, така пишува. Наспрема, денешното македонско, како се викаат на име, односно скратено, како се викаш. На граматички план, како археизм, треба да се спомене присутството на определена форма кај придавките, што е изчезнала во современиот јазик, такви се родниските именија први, даточе, втори, наместо првото стори. Представувањето на македонскиот народен јазик во пишна форма, што е изразено во речникот на Гиро Гянери, продолжува и во наредните години, односно веко преку Дамаскинарската книжина, започната со преводите на Дамаскин студи, преку четириязичникот на Данило, за да заживее посилно во 19-тиот век и тоа во првата половина со делот на Шнаниоркин на Кирил Печилович, кој пишува на својот роден Петовски повод и Јоркин Кршевски на Кратовски повод. Свеста за посебността на македонскиот народ, што понатално подразбира секако и јазична посебност, уште повеки се заселува во почетникот на втората половина на Пеминатиот век, за време на културното заживување на романтизмот во Европа, па и Кајнас. Сејлува група поети писатели кои што творат на својот мајчин јазик. Од тој период е Константин Иладинов, со познатата песна Стрежа за Јук, што ја пишува во Москва, каде што бил студија. Песната ја пишува во народниот голод на поетос, т.е. на струшки јазик. Таа песна, која и денеска се цитира, и те како македонска хинна. Заедно со брат на Димитар, во Хрвац, во Загар, во Печетар, Големиот, зборник на македонски народни песни, во 1861 година. Овој зборник има огромно значење во оформувањето на поетскиот лик на ред македонски писател. За тоа како комплексот од влијанија и притисуци од пропагандите на соседните држави се одрацил во животот и во творештото на нашите интелектуалци, многу сликовито е евидентирано во животниот пат, но и во творештото на нашиот колен поет Григор Прилишев. Тој се школава на грчки јазик. Долго време не можел да се освободи од односно влијание и на грчки јазик е напишал почената поема Северот, кој што победува на поетски конкурс Клатина, а авторот бил закитен со Лаворо Денек и прогласен за втор конкурс. Првичек нас кој е сватки својата заблога со грчкиот јазик и по својото трагање како треба да биде македонскиот литературен јазик, во тегаваше присложени услови, се обидел да создаде нешто невозможно. Еден заедички, обштословенски јазик, во комбинација на старословенски, македонски и бурецки. Еден и словенско постеранство. Првиче, на споменатиот, така да речеме, вешнечки јазик, ке е предаде Хомеровата и Лиарта. Болем дел од Бугарската културна елита тоа да сватува да обид за рушење од наводници јазичното единство на македонски отсо Бугарскиот јазик и следувала многу остра 
и на времето на реакция, што страшно много поводува нашето съпиле на ефтърници. Така, българският литературен критич Арнешо Бончев в тамошните вестници со ирония напишал дека Пърлича Ховера го предава острижен на познатите. Познатите е свиката на Ховер со голема коса и голема тута. Нескусно постато ми познати на полески поетри со потек, очевидно полетен от големата българска пропаганда. Во стихотвово го измива нашият поет со стиховите «А, защо не съм яз поет?» Поет како Пърличев, да я преведа милиада, ама така, што е лобно роденец, да ми се пада тази пайка. После сите утрани или празни иллюзии, Пърличев на край го налага в истински отпад и своята автобиография и да напиша на своят роден македонски язик. Во връзка со настоеванията, председател на сте македонскиот язик, как потребе и чужнословенски язик, различен и от сръвскиот, и от богатскиот, как е представен в обливата за македонските разлика от Кръстия предпочитателство, печатаме в София 1903 година, не посредно по Евиденското остание. Во нея, Висико дава и натрък како треба да изследа македонскиот литературен язик, при това той се определува базата да се взема от централните говори, стригевски, визовски, белешки, што ги ги повърза сите македонски диалит. Висико своята идея с Виковито ја притежа вака, ако македонецот от Северна Македония му подаде рака на умен от Южна, а оно и от Западна му подаде рака на оно и от Источна Македония, нивните раци ке се среднат некъде в Централна Македония и се хръстат в Велешко Пилеско. Трябва особено да се потенцира фактот дека Висилко, нияв потекно от Егейски отдел от Емиджа Батърско, все пак се определил като Штадековме в основата на Македонският оперативен язик да влезат Централните говори една по-далечени и от сръбскиот, и от българскиот. Исто така трябва да се отпреди, че книгата била задранета и унищена от самата печатница. Трябва да се поеди, вече предот, що само посет е сборава толкова да изимаща съдържина, била неприфатлива по тогавашните пусто и обогадите. За трете, останали него в пленерци, от които знаваме, дека денешната форма на нашият литературен язик била наявена още пред сто и повеќе години от големиот македонски реформатор Мисирков. lexicon. I was pleasantly surprised on the detail and everything. Um, and I'd like to come forward. Uh, as part of our tradition, we uh, give a honorarium to the, to the speakers. And I, the silver from the Dr. Pev, we thank you very much for this detailed explanation of the description of the word. И така една кратка история за како и шо јазикот да потекнува да се врати ме назад во скурскиот јазик во Егејскиот дом на Македонија. Така да, Пев, please come forward, дојди. We have also to give you една почесна награда. And at that, I would say also that there is also a couple more copies of the lecture of the contents available. If you haven't got one, uh, there is probably about 10, 15 still remaining. So again, thank you very much for coming and we hope to see you.